Um, hello. Uh, so this is my talk, uh, Games in the Real World. Um, why don't you go play in the road? Um, so that looks weird. That's not right. Okay, imagine this was less pixely, and probably the whole talk's going to be pixely, but let's go with it. Um, so hello, my name is Minket, and um, I'm a game designer, and uh, I'm also a product designer. So under all of that, um, I have been designing games for about 10 years, but still always in the back of my mind, there is the, the idea of making things. So a, a product designer is someone who designs stuff, objects, and so... My games do tend to be kind of more on the physical side. Um, so, for example, like board games or street games, pervasive games, and um, Escape the Room games. Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my screenshot Saturdays tend to look less like this and more often like this. Um, so um, this year I've been designing Escape the Room games. So this was the most recently one. This one was called Framed, um, which was set in an art gallery. And um, you had to, to solve how a murder happened in a locked room. And uh, previous to that, this uh, was a game called Escape from New Palasia, which, um, as you can see, was uh, we would lock people in this slightly oppressive office, no slide, um, to try and escape. Um, so I just wanted to kind of talk, think about the differences between um, computer games and real world physical games. Um, and Jake asked me to come and talk about the making of physical games. I decided to look at, because um, I have got this slightly unique viewpoint of having one foot in computer games and one foot in physical games um, to be able to kind of con con control, compare and contrast. So things that are similar and things that are different. So, um, and you can see this is uh, the game Crossy Road, which is one of my, one of my go-to, um, I've, I've got some time to kill uh, games to play. I really enjoy Crossy Road still. Um, the real world equivalent of running into traffic and playing chicken, not such a favorite. Um, so one of the first things um, I would say uh, that is obviously in a physical game compared to a computer game is the location. So location, location, location. Um, I've chosen three here that, uh, that I would think of as being uh, things that are very specific to making a game in a physical world. So um, the top one, like site-specific or location-specific games, um, location-aware games, and augmented reality. So I just wanted to quickly look through those. Um, so these, not exactly a game, but this is a theatre show uh, which is called Alice in Wonderland, which is um, on again this, uh, this Christmas time. Um, where you you can't experience this um, game. It's kind of a it's sort of like an on rails first person walking simulator, but obviously without the simulation because you're actually in a room. You have you you can't play this game, experience this show unless you are in the specific place. Um, and that it's it's by Les Enfants Tribes, um, who also made the Games of Foot, which is far more of a game because um, it's a Sherlock Holmes uh, based murder mystery game. Um, so those are just some examples of things in physical places where the physical place is the most important part of it. Um, and then to differentiate that from location-aware games, so what I would call an, a location-aware game is something like Subtle Mob or Wiretapper, um, and this was a show I made called Train of Thoughts, which was a game of people watching and trying to guess what was going on in people's minds, um, which you could only play on the train. It didn't matter what train, you didn't have to have a specific train that you went to, but the, the situation was the game needed it to be in a particular place. Subtle mob um, can, happens, it has happened in many different cities, um, but it can only happen when you've got the same group of people and in a, a busy street because it needs that awareness of where the game is playing but they are all in the real world. So whilst a uh, train of thought, you are on a train because you are uh, a real tube train, you are paying attention to the real world in front of you, and that is the environment that you need to be able to 
to, to experience it and for it to make any expense or, or center feel important. Um, this game, Pokemon Go, which I think we've probably, everyone in the room will have heard of. Um, this, is, this is obviously an example of augmented reality. So being out in the real world, but then layering your game over the top with the digital means. Um, and it's not just a, a case of layering just the images over the top and and there is uh, that within this particular game, and this is where I'm going to go on my first diversion away from the actual. Actually, my point is um, so I don't know if if many of you are aware of this, but um, probably someone in the room will know this. So Niantic, who made Pokemon Go, before that they made a game called Ingress, which um, was some people nodding, excellent. Um, which was uh, a game that was uh, kind of like a, a sci-fi thing where people would like tag locations. Um, and this, this, this I, I played it once and it was kind of vaguely interesting. Um, the, uh, the thing that, that kind of stuck in my head was that, so around about the time that Pokemon Go came out, a friend of mine had a glass coffee table that just spontaneously exploded one day. And um, which was very like, quite alarming, very strange. But then a couple of hours later, another friend on the other side of town had a glass of water in her kitchen that also spontaneously exploded. And this got me. This got me thinking. I was like, well, so Niantic's game was based on. Oh, these slides are out of order again. Um, so this was the glass that exploded. And I, I said to my friend, "Can you download? Have you got Pokemon Go? Take a look at that glass and see if there was anything there." And this was what was in the glass of water that was now no longer a glass of water. I had a theory about this. Was, so when Ingress, when they mapped the game, all of those players, all of the things that is underneath Pokemon Go, we've got these lines of buildings and places of significant importance to the people who mapped Ingress. This was the, and you see the larger dots is where more people gather. We've got people gathering and then drawing lines between these things. And I don't know if you've, uh, you know, uh, after um, the Great Fire of London, um, Christopher Wren and um, uh, Hawksmoor, they had to build 52 churches to replace the things that were burnt down. And they decided that they would build these incredibly important gathering places for the people, for humanity. It's a, emotional significant places along the ley lines throughout the city. So all of these churches form ley lines and map those out. So all of these places, all of these dots that the people played Ingress mapped out were places of significant value to them. There's lots of churches, there's parks, there's graveyards. And so what Ingress did was build a new map of places of power to people and then we decided to, on top of that, make a game of summoning demons. So when you play Pokemon Go, what you're kind of actually doing is going to the points of this newly mapped ley lines of our modern world, summoning demons. And, and everyone wonders why 2016 went so bad. <laughs> um, okay. So yes, yeah, so it's it's not just it's not just a game of going out into the street and attacking imaginary monsters. The, that game was built upon people's important places to people, and this is where you go and you meet other Pokemon Go players and you gather. And these are emotional, significant places which were built into the game, and then the game takes you back there. So there's a, a nice sort of call and response woven into this. Um, just a very uh, basic, simple. Augment, augmented reality game. Um, and, and this also made me think about environmental control. So if you're making a game such as um, Overwatch is my example, if you're making a computer game, the environment that your game is in, you have to have made it yourself. There isn't, you start with a blank sheet and so you have to build everything in. You, you build in that gravity goes down or sideways or whatever you've chosen. This is this is different to the real world. You've you've got your your you know the players of your world who go into here. They have to just relinquish 
all assumptions and learn how you wanted that game to work. So as the author of the game, the game maker, you have a significant amount of control and authority within that world. Um, this game is 2.8 hours later. It looks like a video game because there were zombies and chasing, but this happened out in the streets. This is at the complete other end. This was the real world. And um, as you were running away from chasers, you were also trying to run past drunken hen parties and not get hit by cars. So within the, the, from the player's point of view and the game maker's point of view, the amount of control over the environment is, is far less within the hands of the game makers, but then the players know that and they know what to expect. And then within that, those stories, I mean, if, if I had time, I would tell you some stories about this guy. I had, uh, it's, it's, it was, he was terrifying. He was in a car park, and um, I do not have time to tell you all the stories just from this two and a half hours that we spent one night a few years ago, but Holly Grimaggio managed to save my life by throwing a cardigan at someone. So that's, that's just definitely lots of memories. And that's, that's the thing. These are my stories. These are my experiences. Because within that game that someone else has created, because it was in the real world, the play and the, the narrative, the story was all authored by the players. Because we have, in the real world, far more authority, or at least equal authority, to the game maker. We are not at the whim of the game maker when we play in the real world. And so this is my, my final example of something that's like a halfway house. Is, uh, this is a, a theatre show called Sleep No More, um, where you do wander around, you, 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 the audience puts on these masks, you wander around anonymously following the actors in this set that is highly constructed, very built. This world is very much controlled, but it still has that element that, that was the uncanny valley moment of like, can I, am I allowed to do this? Like the world is real, I am actually in a physical place, but it is so controlled um, the, that the, you, you feel like you are definitely a a secondary part, even having no face, having uh, a, a, an ersatz presence within this story. Um, this was um, it's another beautiful pixely picture. So this is uh, this is the kind of feeling that we wanted when we made our escape game, uh, Escape from New Palasia. It was a feeling of control, a controlled environment that you that the players felt like they are aware I am in a game. It is safe here because the game, I, I will do what the game wants me to do. But within that, it was entirely up to them what they did. They took in their own social structures. We gave them certain rules, but it was really up to them if they chose to, to behave within them. And it was mostly about how they interacted with each other. Um, so even, um, this was my level design, because uh, this is what we, we did. We took a big empty room and we built walls and we built partitions. Um, I even set a sort of, I called this my, my narrative decompression. So you started out at the beginning in a shop where you're coming off the street where reality is that you can hear the buses running by. Um, you're still with your mates and you're still kind of talking and chatting. And then we would take them into another space where now they would, in a in more in the story world, but still feeling like part of the real world. They would leave their coats and bags. They would watch a, a video with a backstory, um, and they were still with the host. Then we would take them to the next room where suddenly we just abandoned them. They no longer had their own things. They knew the rules of the world, and they knew that the world was hostile to them. And then finally, we would actually get them into the escape room. So we had stripped away a level of reality. Um, of normality and implant and put them more of our story until they get into the actual final room. Having that control over that space gave us the ability to to tell stories within it. Um, and this is you know, not every game has to have a story, but I am a bit of an evangelist for storytelling within games. Um, and uh, so I. Uh, this is Kurt Vonnegut's story graphs, which there's a very funny video of him, and I would not be able to do it justice, uh, of him explaining this. But um, just the, if you can, you can see this graph, graph is two-dimensional from the beginning to the end of the story. 
good fortune, bad fortune. He says that there are certain patterns or paths which are very satisfying. So um, we've got Cinderella here. Um, things seem to get better. She has something amazingly great. Then it goes really, really bad. And then it kind of ends up getting better again. I really like Kafka's metamorphosis down here, which is just, it's bad. And then it gets worse. And yeah. Um, so uh, we, we all know the concept of like plotting a story, like the story goes from A, B, C, we, it goes uh, beginning, middle, end. Um, but if you've got a physical space, you can also add in a different, adding space within to that story, like where do you put your plot points within physical space? And now you have a, well, a 3D graph of where your beginning of the story, where your narrative fits in within the locations that you're taking your story through. Um, and this is an um, example of storytelling in a game. So this is one of those first, the big, first big indie hits was Braid. Um, so you go through the platformers, solve the puzzles, and then you get to read the story here, which I think we can all agree um, nobody wants. This is not fun. It's like, I'm playing a platformer. I do not want to now read your slightly badly written novel. Um, no, it, it was, no, this is just inappropriate. Um, but yeah, this, is, this can be a way that story, like if you think storytelling just being added to games, this... This is also is part of it, and I'm being a little bit disingenuous because obviously there are ways that you can tell, you can use words like huge block of text in a story game, and it and it works really well. So obviously Twine games, those are text. Um, I saw this the other day, uh, which is just brilliant. Um, you can see. which is just really cool. And it's a very simple thing of just like, yeah, that we're using text here. It is, it is not, and then it's just deleted. Um, within that, this, that, seeing that and thinking about Twine games and, and like using text to tell stories as well and using what's right, it was just made me think about the mechanics, dynamics and aesthetics framework, the way of analyzing games. Um, so if you've got like your uh, so this is written by Haneke, LeBlanc, Zubik. It's a white paper. Um, mechanics are basically like when we talk about game mechanics, the kind of cogs and gears, the thing that would make the game work. Um, the dynamics is what those cogs and gears do to, together to make the game, To when you play it, how they interact and what the game play is. And then the aesthetic. So this is where in Braid, he put his story, his big block of text into the aesthetic of the game. It was just layered on top and was just lying around for you to find. That game we just saw, Walkie Talkie, the, the story as it were, was in the dynamics of the game. It was, it was somewhere else. Um, and I just wanted to illustrate like mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics. Um, and since Robin Honecky's name on the screen, I chose Journey as the mechanics of the game. You've got your, your block that moves around. Um, in Journey, the player controls a humanoid thing that can jump and collect and move around and collect power and make some noises. The dynamics of the game is you are moving around. When you're there, you, 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 can, you can move from around and explore. It gives you that, the dynamics is exploring. You find things you need, uh, you need to, that you need to, to be able to fly. You get past the ob ob obstacles and get to the checkpoints. And then the aesthetics of it, the thing that makes it powerful, is that you are exploring a beautiful desert of a world that you'd forgotten, you'd lost, and you dance with a stranger, and you sing to them, and you keep them warm. When you've got these, if you think about a game in these parts, then where your storytelling sits is either the mechanics, dynamics, or aesthetics. Most people just try and stick it in the aesthetics. I, pre my, I love games that have them in the dynamics, and I desire to make games that have them in the mechanics. Um, one thing that we learned very strongly from making Escape the Room games is that you do not have the opportunity. People are running around, they're, they're panicking, they're trying to solve puzzles. No one wants to stand there and read a block of text. No one's going to read a letter that you've left lying around. Um, and so what we wanted to try and 
do was to put our storytelling into the actual dynamics and mechanics of the game. So um, this is an example of... Um, uh, if you ever watched a film and you, when people walk somewhere and they've got that big epic soundtrack as they walk into Mordor, that's the music and the score is not from the real world. But if you hear that music in a film, you hear that music and it's playing on the radio, then you know that music belongs in that world. It is part of it. It's just leaking out from the world and you're experiencing it as part of the whole thing. Um, that's called diegetic sound design. Um, and so this is an example of the radio in Portal. or The music when you, when you first wake up is coming from that radio. Um, um, when we were designing our escape room, um, we wanted to try and make diegetic narrative. So to take that narrative and put it into the mechanics and put it into the dynamics of the game so that you are, as you play, are getting a sense of a story, a sense of a word, a world, but not having to actually read things and not reading a story you're being told. Yeah, you are, uh, you are being shown like a TV show. You ex experience it directly yourself and that's how you get the story. Um, so uh, this is just the final thing is, is escape rooms. They're all about puzzles. And um, I didn't think I would actually get to this part of the talk. So I'm just going to skip right through it. So uh, not skip right through it, just go fast through it. Um, so as I said, I was a, I'm a product designer. And one of the things that um, I think is really a, an important crossover part from game design to product design is um, the kind of the idea of user experience. And this is uh, a guy called Donald Norman, and he's uh, one, of, one of the books that you have to read. I mean, you, you have to read. When you're a product designer, it's a product design student, um, is the design of everyday things. And this is, he, um, in this book in particular, and there's a 99% invisible um, podcast about this particular thing, he talks about these types of, and uh, we've, we've all encountered them, the kind of door that says pull on it, but it's like a push bar. And then you walk up to this door and you just don't know how to use it. It looks like a pull door, but you push it. Or it looks like a push door and you pull it and you feel stupid. Because somebody has just not thought about how things work and designed it so that you understand it. And you always feel like you you just can't open the door. And so people have to write pull on the handle or they have to write push. Um, these are... the he talks about this in this book, and they get called Norman doors now. is a is a design that is not. It doesn't intuit to you what you are supposed to do to operate it, and in the real world, product design that is a bad thing. Generally, you're aiming to have to not put labels on things, to not have to explain or extrapolate how you're meant to, to work something. You should be able to work it just by looking at it. Um, and this is an example of some very bad user experience design. Um, this, this is my boiler. I was trying to put the radiators on. My boyfriend couldn't figure it out. Um, and I finally pressed it, prayed up, played around with it, pressed a whole bunch of buttons. And I was like, look, it's simple. You just activate the top hat ladder, set the train tracks on fire, and then the radiators go on. It's obvious once you look at it. And it's just like, this is, nah, no. And it, it wasn't fun. It's not a game. It's, I had to play with it. I had to figure out what this, and I was basically solving a puzzle. And if it comes to puzzle design, it's like, yeah, great. Look, we have a frogger button, and um, we have a dial here, which means I can alternate my train tracks. And uh, yeah, the top hat ladder. This, and yeah, what nobody knows, nobody knows what the hell any of this means. Which if it was a puzzle design, that's kind of okay, but it would still be a shit puzzle design. And I think that's, that's the kind of thing is that uh, I wanted to, to, to always like do right, is if you want to be good at something, if you want to be good at doing something badly. So uh, Les Dawson was an amazing pianist, but when he played on TV, he would be playing badly. You have to be really, really good at something to do it badly well. And puzzle design is UX design done badly well. Um, so yeah, and this this was our, one of the one of the kind of set pieces in in Escape from New Pelagia. This machine here, you can kind of get a sense of like this does something. Um, 
Um, we tried really hard to make sure, make it put into the, the actual physical design of it. It's like, it's screaming out, I am functional, I do this. And you've got, a, you get an idea of like, it's like going, being dropped in, uh, in a foreign city and trying to work out how their subway ticket machine works. You're like, you know it works, you know it must work. And that all of the clues, all the intuition clues are there. You just have to inhabit that world more to understand it. So now that I've managed to uh, tie it up, so the, the final thing, the absolutely final thing that definitely crosses over between physical games and computer games is your players. Um, your players are the, the unknown element. So we have a space team here, which I should imagine all of you have played, um, and bonus look, which maybe not so many people will have played. Um, this, uh, it's a game, both of these games rely on having split information and communicating with each other. And people don't think of this, but like communicating with each other is a puzzle in itself. Um, the thing that makes this game hard is the fact that you have to communicate without being able to see. You have to, and the, the thing that makes it fun is the fact that you're talking to another person and trying to communicate with them. Um, and and that's the the kind of the the wild and untamed thing is like who is the author of your play who 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 can create the stories within it if you if you can get your your players to be the author of their aesthetic and to find your story within the dynamic and to be able to solve the mysteries within the mechanic then moving all of those things around and putting them in different places I think that you can you can make much much more uh, strong games, meaningful experiences. Um, yeah, the, the players are key. And that is the final part. Sorry. Thank you.